Okay, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Got some people already watching us on YouTube and uh, I'm sure more will be joining as we're streaming. I'll let our panel participants turn on their video themselves whenever they're ready to do so. Um, my name is Joey. I'm a British Academy postdoctoral fellow at uh, SOAS, University of London. We're, in our, yeah, it's my pleasure to be able to host this uh, webinar for our linguistics department. Today, we're going to be talking about promoting languages online and having a conversation with uh, three people who are actively promoting their own languages online in their free time and uh, also have two uh, linguists with us to give their perspective on um, what are the possibilities in this uh, area of uh, promoting languages through social media. Uh, before we get started, I'll say a few words of introduction. I wanna emphasize that this is a conversation. This is not a research team. We're not uh, sharing any research uh, results. We're really just exploring this topic and some of the complexities there. Uh, you can be part of the conversation if you're watching on YouTube. I'll try to uh, flip back and forth to uh, those of you who are there. So if you have any questions or if anything comes to your mind while you're uh, watching us, feel free to add your question on YouTube and we'll try to get your questions uh, to our participants as well at the end of our conversation. I'll just say a few words about uh, who's here with us in the room. Let's see if I can share my screen to show that. So uh, with us in this conversation are three people who are promoting their language, uh, JC Fred Hagen, William Fenene, and Ben Ocon. And if you've seen that already on our promotional material, maybe you had a chance to check out the content that they're creating online. If you haven't had a chance to check that out, if you're able to multitask a bit, go ahead and check out uh, what they're doing online. Uh, they're gonna be sharing lots about their experiences. I wanna give you a bit of an idea just in case you don't know the background of these languages. So everyone has a clear idea of how different these three languages are. The Gwich'in language, Athabascan language. So it's uh, spoken in uh, North America both on the Alaska side, the American side, and in the Northwest Territories in Canada. There may be about three to 5,000 or more Gwich'in people. Uh, and it's estimated that maybe about 500 people uh, in that group are still speaking the language. The second language we're gonna be talking about is uh, Samoan, a Polynesian language spoken in a place that couldn't be much more different than Gwich'in, Pacific Island. Uh, the islands of Samoa make up mostly the independent state of Samoa but there's also some American territories that are Samoan islands as well. There may be about 250,000 people in the Samoan islands and they use the language uh, as their primary language. Uh, and there may be another 600,000 or more Samoans in the diaspora, it's primarily Australia, New Zealand, America, and their language use is gonna be significantly lower. Epic is not, again, a very different language in a different place. This is a map of Nigeria and Cameroon showing where Ifik is spoken on the southern coast of Nigeria, bordering Cameroon. And there may be around 600,000 people who use this as their primary language and potentially up to another 2 million people who use it as an additional language for a certain context to communicate with people from other groups. Also with us, is Robert Elliott, who's Associate Director of the Northwestern Language Institute at the University of Oregon and Sally Kokumafonye, who among other titles is a professor of linguistics at the University of Chicago. So we'll get to them a bit later in our discussion. Okay, so with that introduction, uh, let's start our conversation. Um, it's okay if I turn some of our videos back on for our panelists. I will. Hi, Ben. Good morning. Hi, JC. Great. Good to have you morning. all with us. Uh, let's start with you, JC. Would you mind uh, giving us first a greeting or a short introduction in your language? 
Then Greensy Sitcha Nai, She JC Firth Hagen, and you uh in Inkly and you Vic I think I said that backwards. But good morning, everyone. My name is JC Firth Hagen. Gutch in from Canada. There's also Gutch in in Alaska. I'm born and raised in the Nubik Northwest Territories, Canada, currently living in Edmonton, Alberta. I'm Gutch in, Dinjiju Gutch in, and I'm the daughter of Sylvia Firth and Willard Hagen, granddaughter of Sarah McLeod Firth and John Firth, Margaret Hagen and Willard Hagen. And that's a traditional introduction in my language which I said in English, but I would mm -hmm. say where I'm from and who my parents and grandparents are. And hi, Shadri Shonihli. My heart is happy to be on this panel with you all. Hi, Cho Masi. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, JC. Now, some people might know your story already. There's a, a video, a short documentary about why you're doing this as well online. But for those who don't know you, could you give a brief introduction of why are you, why did you decide to pick up your phone and start promoting language online through social media? Uh -huh. Yes, Masi, thank you. Um, promoting my language, which in on social media, has been a more like more accessible, easier way to um, get, a, get a conversation going and raise awareness towards our languages, in particular Indigenous languages, such as my own, that are in a danger of not being spoken in like a generation or two, as I've been told for a majority of my life. Um, social media is such an accessible way to get a conversation going around so many age groups from our youth to our elders. And because there is less than 500 approximate speakers of my language standing at 5% of my language and nation still speaking the language, of around 5,000 or so which in and yeah, just creating a social media platform and a hashtag just follow is, has been like an amazing, incredible initiative and way to start a conversation about my language which in, um, teaching the language, creating learning resources, building a conversation and raising awareness. And it's been about five years now. And here I am on a live panel for the University of London with so many amazing language champions. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thanks, Tracy. We'll come back to you with some more questions, but just to introduce our other uh, panelists first. Will, would you mind giving us a, a greeting or short introduction in Samoan? Uh, sure, it's Talofalawa Ya Tauma, Alo Ingo O Vidyamu Fanene. Basically, my name is Will Fanene, and thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, it's great to be here today. And um, I live in Illinois, in, in the United States, uh, far away from many Samoans. And uh, I actually started, uh, well, I grew up in the Samoan culture uh, most of my life. And then I moved away to come to college, and um, but I didn't know the language. So I, I just, I, one day I just said, I, I, I want to know, like I want to know right now. So I knew a lot of words, and I knew that most people in my generation were like myself. And um, you know, w once I just started putting these resources together, I, I kind of put the language together for myself. It just made sense, and it never made sense before. And then um, I just had this fire in me to. Um, to show other people because I, I, I felt like I connected the dots and I, I wanted to share that with um, people like myself um, because there's a, a lot of shame that comes with uh, not knowing your own language, you know, especially if you grew up in it. And, you know, I, I'd never figured out why, um, why I couldn't connect the dots, but then once, once it all just kind of clicked and made sense, I wanted to share it with everybody. So that's, that's uh, pretty much my story on why I got on, online, I just wanted to share it um, because it just felt like good news and I didn't want to keep it to myself, so. Yeah, that's great, thanks, Will. Uh, we'll. We'll come back to you as well, but first to introduce Ben as well. Ben, would you mind giving us a, a greeting or introduction in your language? Sorry, I think you're still muted. Can you unmute Ben? Great. Okay, um, can you hear me now? 
Yes. Okay. Nima, e kom do ami kere ben o kon ami di andik bep i ko e fok ami to obi e fok ami ko nyung di andik bep ke u fong wen tai fio e mi e di orente o ta Javis University mi ke obi nyung kashi basi. Okay, um, that's just a brief introduction of saying that uh, my name is Ben Okun and I am an language teacher and I'm also um, a graduate research assistant with Dr. Jarvis University here in Cross River State. Um, I'm so happy to be here this evening. This is evening right now in Nigeria. Um, it's, it's a beautiful opportunity to be here. I actually have the strong passion to ensure that the effort language is promoted and the effort language is preserved over time. So that's just what really, really informed the whole essence of me trying to um, put up one or two things about the language online. So um, basically uh, in Nigeria, let, let me follow up with a more specific question, Ben, because people might wonder, you know, if it's this language that has you know, millions of people speaking it. Um, so why, why particularly did you feel like, oh, I need to still promote this language, even though it seems like a lot of people speak the language? Okay, yeah, so many persons speak the language. We have about 600,000 native speakers and also probably 2.5 million second language users. Um, over time, the language was one of the major languages in Nigeria, as it were. It was um, rightly the very first language to have an orthography and the very first language to have a dictionary. But with time, um, it has really, really, the interest in the language has really, really reduced. So um, that's why I, I, I thought that social media is one of the major places where people gather, a, a major community where people gather. So I had to come. one or two things to ensure that first of the people, because the level for the language is quite low, and that's why it hasn't really grown to the level other major languages in Nigeria are. You are muted, Joey. I can't hear you. I should unmute myself before I speak. For those who maybe don't know the Nigerian context, of course, there's hundreds of languages Languages, and there's a few other languages that are, have even more speakers than Efik that kind of seem like more majority languages in that context. So it's a very complex yeah. context in that mm -hmm. country. Uh, ben, let me come yeah. back to you with a second question as well. What, what are some of the uh, successes that you've seen, the encouragement uh, that you've seen through what you're doing in social media and what are some of the frustrations and challenges? Okay, um, I've, I've really been encouraged in a very big way. Um, firstly, um, a, a lot of if a person will not continue from the UK, the news and Canada as well, uh, they, they were quite excited that such a project is on. So I got a lot of them reaching out to me for personal classes because most of them migrated while they were kids and they did not have the opportunity to then learn the language at birth. And also, so I've seen so so uh, so it has been a source to reawaken the language. In the minds of the people outside the country who are efox probably migrated before time and also currently the people it has been a source of inspiration as well because i've seen so many so many persons have reached out telling me oh this is great we wanted this i wanted this for my kid i wanted this for my family and and, and the rest so it has been worthwhile i see a lot of persons getting or get, getting on to also do the little they can in their own social space. I, I think in the last couple of uh, months that I've been active with the folk on social media, I've, I've seen up to three, four persons who have also taken up such responsibility because they're like, wow, this is great. So if somebody is doing this in my own language, I can also do that. Okay, um, as for the frustrations, it has always been um, acceptance, trying to get so many persons to accept the fact that it's a complete language. It should be used, not only in the domain of um, household, it should be used also in the social media domain. So that, that, that has been a major source of frustration and also um, the ability to have pedagogical resources to teach children 
as well has also been a, a major challenge in one way or the other. But generally, it has been a great, a great, a great, a great endeavor, a great endeavor to be part of. Okay, it was, a, it was a bit un unclear with your connection. There are a few places it sounds like you're saying that the challenges are people's mindsets about where the language can and can't be used and should be used on social media and the availability of resources for teaching and for children to, to use the language. Yes, okay. yes, yes, yeah. yes. Great. Thanks for sharing yes. that, Ben. Uh, JC, we'll jump back to you with those same questions. What, what's been encouraging for you in terms of seeing impact and people responding positively? And what have been some of the challenges of trying to promote the language through social media? Yes, I'm very um, happy to say that the hashtag speak which in me has been described as a positive movement. There could be a lot of like negativity in the media regarding like our communities and our nations. And I'm happy to be able to, um, yeah, create something positive and to share it. And it's been so positive. I think on all my social medias for hashtag speak with Jendemi, it um, adds up to around 3,000 people I'm sharing to. And that's across so many different social media platforms as is written on the poster, like follow the hashtag on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, SoundCloud where I'll help create and share um, work made by myself and others to uh, teach which in on social media and to um, share other work that's been done by such as like which in tribal council that works with which in elders to create and uh, language content and preserve our language and teach it. And um, yeah, it's been very, beautiful, inspiring others to learn the language, create their own hashtag speak my language to me movements. And I've been able to travel around the Arctic, uh, giving presentations as well as doing it remotely, such as right now and to the uh, Canadian uh, UNESCO organization as well as in Mexico. And yeah, I'm very happy to be it such like a pivotal movement for languages and language revitalization, such as being the year of indigenous languages and now the what, decade of indigenous languages through the United Nations, I believe. And um, what can be challenges or obstacles is like, um, yeah, like when our elder passes away, passes away like a, it's a whole library, it's, such an important member of our nation and we lose so much knowledge and it's yeah it's hard um when there's like we don't even know how many speakers there are really in my language maybe there's 200 maybe there's 100 maybe there's less I was in a one week long immersion language nest program for my language and it was really amazing but it's like, uh, yeah, the reality of my language, like our language speakers may not be speaking all the time. And it's only like maybe the same few elders that are working on the language. And there's like, uh, yeah, thankfully there's a lot of us like young people that are interested in the language, but yeah, just kind of seeing it from different standpoints. And of course it's always, could be a little frustrating. How do I get more people interested in speaking the language? And uh, yeah, always like, uh, especially when it comes to like social media algorithms, trying to get information out there as best as I can. But at the end of the day, like we're all doing our best and there's always gonna be uh, the ones that are interested and wanna learn the language. So hi Cho, thank you. That's great, thank you, JC. Same questions for you, Will. What, what have been some of the positive impacts and results you've seen and good feedback? And what's been some of the challenges that you are obstacles you, you continue to face? Uh, well, I get some great feedback every day. As, uh, I mean, when I wake up every morning and then I read all these messages from people and um, you know they, they tell me that they learned more you know, in the past couple of days than they've learned their whole life. You know, that, uh, that kind of stuff, it really touches me. So, um, and it keeps me going because at the same time you do have, uh, you know, some negative stuff, you know, I'll get to that in a minute, but 
Um, a lot of people say that they teach their kids through me, like the kids just sit down and watch, um, you know, my Instagrams every day and uh, uh, on YouTube as well. And so I, I do have to, you know, kind of be careful on, you know, keep it really kid kid friendly because um, sometimes I try to mix uh, entertainment with, uh, um, you know, with the educational component. And uh, so once I realized that, and I know the kids are watching, so, you know, that's kind of, uh, it's not a bad thing, but it's, 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 it's kind of difficult. So that's, I guess that's one of the challenges, um, you know, and you, to just to be recognized every day, you get a lot of celebrities and stuff that, you know, I've never had that before. So it's kind of like, wow, you know, that people are actually watching it and they're paying attention and they're sharing it. So, you know, those, those have been the main things is just uh, getting the word out there because it hasn't even been a year uh, where I started doing this. And it's like, uh, it just seems very impactful. And, and that's what a lot of people are, are have been relating to me. Um, in terms of uh, challenges, um, a lot of elders, you know, that came from Facebook. So I avoided Facebook because a lot of them, you know, they're just people, older people have their ways. So I went to Instagram uh, purpose, purposefully. Um, I started on, uh, you know, I did Twitter a little bit, but I didn't get much traction over there because uh, they're really, um, you know, 40 characters or 140 characters. But on Instagram, I was able to kind of, uh, you know, capture them in that one minute, you know, and, and do as much as I can. Um, but um, the elders uh, or the people that the native speakers, um, they kind of some of them feel like you shouldn't teach on social media. So I, which I still think is kind of interesting, but I mean, that's not everybody, but that's that's been one of my challenges is uh is it respectful you know and that's just something that i'm learning like i don't know if social media is new you know teaching on social media is new i, I don't know what you mean to, about so I, I try to keep that balance as well um being respectful um in the samoan way because um samoans is all about respect even in the language even you know one character you can be disrespectful so uh, i try to make sure that i uh, really walk that line um, you know, and then also too, in terms of resources, there's not there's not many very uh, available resources out there. Um, so you have people that speak only slang Samoan, um, which is very different from the book Samoan. So then when I'm on there teaching, especially when I first started, um, you know, almost every day someone say that's not a word, that's not right, that is not this. But I get I get everything from the book, and then I cross reference with mom and you know people in my family. Um, but um, they're older, but then you have younger kids saying, that's, I never heard that word before. That's not, that, that can't be a word. And then the same thing, the older people will say, well, that's, who says that? That's not. So I had to make sure that all of my information um, is, you know, something that, um, you know, first of all, is true and accurate. Uh, and then also, um, you know, something that everybody can, can relate to. And then if it is just slang, I have to bring that out. If it's, it's if it's just something that they say in the books, I have to bring that out. So that's just another challenge, but it's, you know, it's not really a, a obstacle. It's just it's things that I need to be very cognizant of when I'm, when I'm making my videos uh, on social yeah. media. It sounds like you have lots of different audiences that you're potentially reaching at once and maybe they have conflicting priorities, right? Right, right, <laughs> exactly. Okay. Thanks. Well, we'll be sure to get back to some of these topics. So I want to bring in our uh, linguistics experts, Robert Elliott and Professor Mufuenye, uh, if we can get your videos rolling again. And Robert, we'll go to you first with the question. You've worked a lot with teaching languages and creating digital media to help teach as well. We we don't really think anyone's probably going to go through a, a Twitter feed or you know Instagram stories and learn a language entirely that way. But how does social media, from your perspective, become effective in helping people who want to learn or encouraging people to learn. Uh, thank you, Joey. Um, first of all, Shukhmaitsky, good morning from Oregon. Um, it's a real pleasure to be on this panel with Will, Ben, and JC. It's, it's fantastic to meet you and hear about the work that you guys are doing. It sounds really, really interesting and um, dynamic and, and useful for the audiences you're working with. Um, Joey, yeah, the, I, I think the short answer to your to your question is um, is is yes, people are not going to learn language necessarily completely from social media or from digital sources, but at the same time, it does add a lot. Um, and so I want to try to summarize what it can add, I think, because I'm hearing a lot of that from 
from the part of uh, the panelists today of, of exactly what they're doing that that um, we we can see across broad spectrums of different language groups that um, that seem to really be working and helping in these situations. So um, so I think, first of all, uh, technology really functions as an extension or an augmentation of the learning process. Nothing can really substitute for that um, intergenerational learning, the natural learning of language. Whenever that's possible, that's always the best. But um, but the social media, the um, technology can supplement that and augment that and help that um, encourage it and go along. So there's some ways that I think that happens. One is um, we've heard a little bit about working with younger learners, and I think younger learners in particular gravitate towards technology. Um, I've seen it with my own children, how they just really um, go to technology. And also when I'm visiting um, immersion schools with languages and you see the, the children really want to get on technology, um, a lot of them, and they feel comfortable in that space. So it's, I think it's very important that, um, that, that languages are represented in those spaces to, to, uh, because there's a natural gravitation towards there. The second thing I'm thinking about is the time and space um, aspects that technology can, can break down. So um, it's the anytime, anywhere learning nature of that technology can do so that you can pop out your phone at home or on the bus or um, on your break at work and you can interact with uh, the language in those, in those places. And without technology, um, you have to have another speaker of the language close by in order to actually do that. So that anytime, any place aspect breaks down the barriers of time and space that I think that can allow more opportunities for, for working with language. Um, the third thing I'm thinking about is, uh, is, is how the um, language can be validated in, 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 in um, using uh, technology. So I've seen cases where um, uh, sometimes young people feel that our language, there isn't really a lot of use for our language. I'm not sure where, it's, it's kind of an older thing, but, um, but by seeing language represented on some of the newer platforms, people feel that, oh, okay, my language can, has a right to be there too. It, it, it's, it's, um, it's great to see that. And, and there's a place for this for my language here. It doesn't have to be left out of this new realm. So, but just by seeing that it can, some people talk about language prestige or relevance of the language. Um, some people don't like that term, but, um, but I just wanted to say that I think that people recognize their language online and that validates and makes them feel that there's a place for their language. The final thing that I'm thinking a little bit about um, is that the it just carves out another space or domain or use a place that people can use the language so um so you know w w a lot of the languages that i work with we we're in similar to jc's case where we have very few speakers and some of the languages even there are no speakers left that i've worked with and so they're working with documented materials um, so the opportunities for using language are very very few very rare so uh, what um, I think the technology can do is actually allow, create spaces that um, if you're in a uh, very dispersed case, like Will was talking about, how they've got people all over the place. He's in Illinois and the communities are back in Samoa. He can bridge, he can actually create um, a room to, to interact and use the language using technology that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So those four things, I think, are things I'm little aspects I'm hearing from each of the uh, the, the panelists today, and I think that um, those though they're using technology and in, in really in a lot of the ways that they that um, we know that it helps benefit, um, even though we know it can't completely supplant um, face to face natural language learning. That's great, thanks, Robert. Uh, in a bit, we'll come back to some of those topics. So if Will, Ben, and JC, if you have any questions or comments you want to make, maybe keep those in your mind or write them down. But first, we're going to go to Professor Mufwini to make sure he has a chance to, uh, to give us some input. Professor Mufwini, you've written a lot about why people do and don't speak languages, why they start or stop speaking a language. And in some of your work, you've emphasized the economic pressures that people face. And that seems to be really one of the overwhelming factors in why people shift from one language to another. In these cases, some of the languages that you know, Will, Ben, and JC are promoting aren't languages where the people necessarily feel that socioeconomic pressure. They don't necessarily get an immediate benefit from it. But still, these people are online trying to encourage others to speak the language despite the lack of economic motivation to do so. But from your perspective, what, what other motivations are there? What can they tap into 
when there is no mo motiv economic motivation to speak a language, how do they really encourage people to change their language use? Morbeck, Zinemen, often suck up, no more Congo. I just said in Kiansi greetings to all of you. Uh, and I said my name as it would be said in Kiansi, often Sato, with my last name said often coming at the beginning rather than uh, last. Um, and uh, I'm from the Democratic Republic of Congo. I've been gone for over 40 years. In, during that period, I think I have come only twice or three times across people that could speak Kiansi. So my Kiyansi is very rusty. If any Mulyansi that heard me out there probably would be laughing because I spoke it with an accent, although it is my heritage language. Um, Joey, uh, coming back to your um, commentary and question, uh, what sounds particularly relevant to me in this, uh, in the context of this webinar is the affordability of the technology. And one thing I want to underscore here to which um, Robert Elliot alluded is the fact that the mass media are complementing what would be our natural social interactions. Uh, in the modern world, traditional societies I should say traditional communities have been disrupted. A lot of them have become discontinuous. So that members of these communities are no longer at the same place and don't have the traditional opportunities to practice the languages. And these are very critical factors, either in sustaining the languages we stay together, that we stay connected, and the mass media are doing precisely that, or if you cannot stay co uh, connected, then you practice your language less and less, then your competence in the language becomes rusty. If your competence is rusty and you have children, you cannot transmit the language to your children anymore because sometimes you think, you know, what's the point of trying to speak a language that I don't speak well anymore. So there are many other factors. But what I also want to um, highlight here is that the new technology of mass media comes with a lot of constraints. It's a technology that is predicated essentially on electricity. Whether you use a telephone or you use your computer, you need power. And if you look at space maps of the world in the dark, you see that a whole lot of work, the world is still in the dark. There are only some places that are really well lit. And that means that there are a lot of people out there that cannot afford electricity or simply do not have access to electricity at all. And even when you have a telephone and you, your telephone doesn't have to be connected to a source power all the time, there are times when you cannot recharge your telephone, which means you cannot remain connected with the rest of the world. And if you have a computer, it's the same kind of constraint. And that's where economic factors become particularly relevant. In a territory in a polity where economy is strong and where the telephone is easily affordable, where people have access to electricity, the social media are going to do a great job. If you are in a polity where a large proportion of the population can afford a computer, and a lot of these apps that you can use, you use them on your computer, and you have regular access to electricity, the mass media are going to work fantastically. But one thing that we have discovered around the world, especially during this pandemic, is that even in 
countries of the economic north, of the global north, that is the developed countries. There are still segments of the population that are, different, that are disenfranchised. So these are limits that we have to overcome. Um, otherwise, it's super that people have become creative and imaginative enough to domesticate the technology and make it to serve some of our communicative needs and make it to serve our endeavor to revitalize or maintain languages that are really endangered around the world. Okay. And what I appreciate very much about this technology is that even if you are thousand, thousands of miles apart, you can still remain connected with your family in your homeland or with your friends that have gone to distant places. And the more regularly you interact, the more likely your knowledge of the language is going to be maintained and your language is not necessarily invented. Even if you cannot use your language in the public domain, you can still use it in the, your private domains. And these are the ways, some of the ways in which you can sustain the vitality uh, of a language. When I said my knowledge of the has become rusty, it's largely because when I emigrated from the Congo and came to the United States, there was no cell phone yet at that time in the 1970s. Most people in the Congo could not afford the landline phone. And therefore, I couldn't communicate regularly with members of my family. I'm a linguist. I can write my language. But the people back home couldn't read what I would write in Tiansi. And so technology really constrained me from using my language on a regular basis. And, but that technology depends on economic power, which means that a whole fall of economic development that must be factored in. So endeavors by Ben, by Bill and by JC are really praise worthy. They should be encouraged, but we should embed these endeavors in the broader context where we exert more pressure on politicians to invest more in economic development so that they can support such efforts. That's what I can say. Great, thank you very much, Professor. Yeah, so it sounds like in, in summary, the motivation there is the social connections that you're able to maintain with people who are, are far away. And that's a major factor in, in what would motivate people to continue speaking their language using the technology. But of course, that requires this minimum amount of economic development that's not present everywhere in the world. And so using social media, of course, is not a one size fits all solution for everyone. And I think even these three languages here, you know, are going to have different uh, methods and, and different places where it works better or not. Uh, let, let me go right back to Will, Ben, and JC. After hearing from Robert and Sally Coco, do you guys have any questions or responses or what are you thinking about in, in response to what they've shared? Ben, you want to unmute yourself and go ahead? Okay. Um, I, I think I would like to um, ask um, Robert's question, and it's also based on the observation I've had. I, I, I know I have a good community on Facebook who are actually very interested in following up what I do. And while trying to teach on the counting system of the effort language, I had the idea of maybe getting um, a call credit recharge pin, and I um, changed the numbers from English numbers to the effort numbers so that anybody who could crack the effort numbers could actually get the reward, which is the PIN, the call credit, what they were using making telephone calls. Okay, so I discovered that 
um, uh, messages and posts like that do attract traffic. So um, Robert, with your experience in teaching language, uh, could you please talk more on the place of reinforcement and rewards in motivating people to learn language, either first language or second language? Uh, that's a great, that's a really great question, Ben, and um, something people are really looking at for the last few years. There's something called gamification that they talk about when it comes to language learning technology. And gamification basically means making these things like a puzzle or there's an award or a reward or a badge that you get when you work through a set of material. So people feel like they've gotten that reinforcement. That, that's exactly that you're talk, what you're talking about. So the fact that you, you kind of came up with that on your own, I think, is, is wonderful um, that there's a reward. They get the, the, the phone card um, by, by solving the puzzle, by figuring out the numbers. Um, that there's a lot of evidence that suggests that um, that technology can do this and that it's very effective for keeping learners coming back for more. They get they get really engaged that way. That said, you know, um, com ultra competitiveness is not a part of um, all, every culture. And um, so being overly competitive, sometimes you just want to watch those boundaries a little bit so that people aren't feeling like oh, I never win or, you know, or there's there's sometimes cooperative learning is also quite useful where you get people cooperating rather than competing. So I think, um, you know, knowing the cultural group that you're working with is really important. And, um, and probably also for many groups kind of mixing up what you do. So sometimes it's more cooperative learning, sometimes it might be a little bit of competitiveness. But I think you're, you're uh, that idea of experimenting and trying things out is 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 perfect. That's wonderful. It sounds like a really good way to go. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Will or Jason, do you have any questions or comments you want to throw in? I'm just going to take it in. Oh, go, go ahead, Jason. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you to our um, speakers. And I just want to say thank you for um, mentioning, sorry, Dr. Professor Susan Francation Sally Coco. Uh, like a lot of um, my nation uh, doesn't have access to the internet or connectivity. And that's really important, a really important aspect, especially as we move forward in the digital age to how a people without a connection, even electricity are kind of getting left behind and even ignored in some cases. So I just wanted to say something about that it is yeah, near and dear to my heart and I hope to work further connecting people that aren't connected through social media as an example and to Robert um, I, I'm just curious to see what do you what initiative what do you find that works when it comes to social media initiatives and language revitalization in particular to uh, for languages that don't have very many speakers or any at all. Thank you. So um, I, was that a question, JC, that you want to know what works? Yeah, if you don't mind answering. <laughs> well, at Oregon, we have nine federally recognized tribes and other groups, and each group is very different than the other group. Um, and then we're working with other, you know, and then seeing the diversity of language situations and contexts, everyone is, is really different. So it's hard to draw any broad conclusions that uh, of what works um, across situations. Um, I, I, I did want to say something I, I did hear like Will talking a little bit about um, one caution of working with elders who sometimes don't feel the language should be put out. So that's always a tough balance because sometimes elders feel that it shouldn't be recorded. Um, and, but at the same time, we know that the younger learners are engaged and interested by this. So how do you balance that um, respecting what the elders wishes are um, and what the young people might be engaged with? And so that's, that's such a tough balance to do. And so, you know, I, it, every people I've, every people I've worked with, it's just kind of having to find a, a a slightly different way to work with that um, that works for them and then their community and their elders. Um, 
other, I mean, and I would say the same thing. I, I, I don't know that I could say any broad thing that works. Sometimes I think it's important though, that like we're seeing right now with the COVID happening that uh, we didn't have conferences with Zoom like we're having now. We didn't have meetings constantly like Zoom like we have now. And, and everybody has had to just jump in and do it. And we've all made mistakes. <laughs> And that's, I think, is and and but we're all learning and getting better at it. And and so Joey is is doing a fantastic job with putting this kind of conference together and getting us um, communicating ideas. And so I think for a lot of the social media stuff, you have to just jump in and try it, um, being respectful of the elders' wishes and other people of the community. But at the same time, don't hesitate if it's not perfect. Don't wait for just the right opportunity. Try something out and you will make mistakes, but you'll learn from that and you'll have a better next time you go about it, um, you'll be better at it and you'll and, and you'll find what works for your community. And also the other thing that came up was for the, um, the, the audience, like if you're working with young kids versus older people, you might have some different kind of humor that's involved or engagement. So just you have to jump in and do it and try it and you'll learn from that. So don't sit back and wait and wait for the perfect. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the. The good enough, I guess, would would be my um, suggestion on that. Thanks, Robert. Will, did you have a question or comment as well? I just want to say uh, I, I absolutely agree with uh, what Robert was what what he just said, and it's very encouraging too because I mean people say some nasty stuff, you know, coming from online. Um, so you know, when you do make a mistake, you you're almost ready to just give up. Like, what? Why am I even doing this? But um, but you have way more. Um, well, at least I do. Um, uh, you know, way more people encouraging you and thanking you and all of that. So, um, but I mean, almost every day it, I make a mistake. If, if you let other people, you know, if they tell me, yeah, you know, they're I'm making mistakes every single day. So, um, you know, just trying to figure out my community. And I guess, you know, I'm one of the only ones, and just like everyone else here. Um, you're one of the only ones, if not the only one, doing it uh, for your for your community. So um, it's just, a, I guess, just a matter of staying encouraged and um, having the thick enough skin to to make it through all of that. And um, I, I guess I would suggest, you know, maybe documenting everything um, so that someone else can um, can come behind you and and not make those same mistakes. Um, you know, hopefully that's something everyone, at least at least that's what I'm thinking when, from what after what Robert just said and what everyone else is saying, you know, putting something together, I don't know what you call it, maybe a curriculum or something where people are, um, they just kind of know the rules or at least what worked for you. And then, um, you know, can kind of, um, you know, make a road for someone else to go so that they don't have to go over those same obstacles, and, um, you know, stumbling blocks, so they can just get right into the content because ultimately that's what I want to do. I just want to put the content out there so that people can learn. But there, when you're going through social media and you don't have, you don't have a, a way, like you don't have any other reference. It's like all of these things are blocking you from getting the content out um, because you just no one's ever done it before. At least not that I know of. So, and, and if there is somebody that has done it, I would like to get their, you know, I would pick their brain so I wouldn't have to go through a lot of this side side stuff, you know. Could I, could I just add something to that? Because it, you, you mm -hmm. made me think of something that I think is also very, I think that's super critical to chart what you do to help others that are coming later. But the other thing is a lot of technology platforms come and go. So what's popular now will not be popular in two years or five years or 10 years down the line. So what I think is really, really important to do or valuable to do is to keep those source materials um, easily adaptable to a new environment. Um, so keep them stored, keep them labeled well, keep them so that they're ready to be repurposed into some other technology platform that comes around and becomes popular a few years down the line. And you won't have to recreate everything from scratch. So be careful of something that you put everything up there. And then when that product is gone, it's all locked in there. <laughs> you want it to, you want to keep those original material language materials, which are like gold. Those are so valuable for you. Keep those for yourself and for other people that may end up working in the area as well. You made me think of TikTok. <laughs> yeah, I, I, social media are telling us something about how technology can be used to keep languages alive. 
um, the social media are telling us that you can extrapolate from that particular level and use different languages in the media in general. There should be room for sharing time in the larger media and making different languages present in the media. But this is also predicated on economic development. And there are ways of solving some of the problems in places where people cannot afford individual TVs, for instance. There may be a central TV in the village, large place where people gather. And they can go and watch TV in their language. Okay. And everything like needed to be broadcast at the national level. It can be organized so that people can see this at the local level. And so here we are talking about economic development on two levels, at the level of the individual, but also at the level of governments, at the level of nations, where they can give opportunities to people to practice uh, uh, the languages. And Speaking of motivation, you get more motivation when you see other people interact in your language. Then you find it useful. Okay. Very often people give up their languages because those languages become redundant. Or should I say useless in the environments in which they are because they have no motivation for using them. Several people have said in the literature, well, people lose pride in the language. It's not a matter of pride. What people lose uh, are opportunities to use the language. And we should create those opportunities. And technology is there to enable us to contribute to create more and more opportunities for people to use the language. Yeah, thanks. That's, that's really important that promoting languages on social media is you know, one part of a bigger picture. You also need the space and the opportunity to use the language. And you also need enough structural support or at least not say any structural oppression that's keeping people from, from using the language as well. Um, so I've got a bunch of, we've got some questions coming in from you too. So I just want to get to at least some of those before we have to wrap up our session. One was a practical question for Will, Ben, and JC on what platforms you're using. I think you're all using different platforms for different reasons in social media. So what's been your experience? What works for what context and what, what, what yeah, what's your preference for social media platforms? Okay, um, personally, uh, I, I'm, I use the YouTube platform, the Twitter, and also LinkedIn and Facebook. Um, yes, yeah, so I think um, the experience has been massive. Um, basically, people will adapt short text and read because they wouldn't to read much, and people will be very comfortable with limited videos on YouTube. And so, probably some videos on Facebook and then move to the I had a bit of trouble hearing you at the end there, Ben. Can you just repeat the last thing you said? Okay, okay. I said I said that um, I use YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. I, I think the question was the platforms mm -hmm. I yeah. use, and um, each of these platforms, each of these platforms, I ensure that because, for example, like the Twitter shorts are okay because people wouldn't want to spend much time to read on long threads. And also on Facebook, some short trivia just to capture the attention of people. And also on YouTube, probably some animated views and something they could play with. So longer content on YouTube and just short bits on Twitter, Facebook. Uh, what about you, Will? You said you preferred Instagram for your audience. Are you branching out to other platforms as well? Right. Well, I'm, I'm also on YouTube. Um, the same videos that I put on Instagram, I put on YouTube as well. Um, but um, I didn't, didn't really promote it as much. I made an app um, earlier this year. So that, that app kind of takes people to YouTube. I don't, I don't, like I said, I don't really promote uh, the YouTube. I probably should. Um, but Instagram, like I said, uh, most of the, the, my audience, they're, you know, my age and younger. So I, I people 40 on down to, you know, five years old. Um, I, and, and again, like I said, uh, Facebook really didn't work for my community. 
um, because like I said, most of the elders are on there and they just had every, you know, they, they had something to say about everything I put out. So, um, and then I figure you already know the language, so I don't, I don't need to be over here anyway. Um, I, I started uh, trying to do a TikTok, but I just couldn't figure out the platform. And then by the time I was really about to, about to get into it, um, you know, I heard it was going to get shut down, but it didn't. So I just left TikTok alone. So right now I'm on uh, Instagram and um, I do have my, uh, my online class. So people come to Zoom uh, a couple of times a week and, you know, we'll learn and we'll speak on there. Um, but for the most part, is in terms of social media, it's uh, it's primarily Instagram for me. Have you seen any overlap with people that you've encouraged to use the language through Instagram, going to those Facebook groups and becoming more active participants in using the language? Uh, I, I, that I'm not sure about because I, I I rarely use Facebook. I only go on there if I get a notification from a family member or something like that. But that that's I'm glad you mentioned that. That's something I'm gonna I'm going to check. What I encourage everyone to do uh, on Instagram or people that message me from other platforms is just to go out and use the language and, you know, just just use what you learn because um, there's so many and some ones don't even realize how many dialects and how many uh, uh, people, you know, people speak differently just around the world. Like some ones are all over the world in different pockets, you know, so I just tell them to go out and use it. Um, and I just kind of teach them a general book. Um, format and then they'll just have to adapt to because they're going to whoever they're around they're going to tell them you need to say it like this or you need to say it like that or you know they'll just pick up how they're, they're speaking it so and I, i've heard a lot of that they just said okay we left the class or um i tried this uh, from instagram and then i went out and you know spoke it and you know i just kind of adapted so um you know it's it's effective it's just uh you know a different way of uh of doing it JC, what about you? What's been your experience with different platforms? Yeah, for me, it's um, I can say that Twitter over the years was like my number one platform for a while. Everything I posted was there's so much engagement. And now it's kind of leading to more, more towards Instagram. I get a lot more engagement, comments, but on Facebook, everything's kind of shared more widely. As an example, I had like a few people help me advertise this panel. Uh, my YouTube and SoundCloud doesn't really get much traction, but I also don't really um, advertise it. But uh, like, as long as there's a hashtag to follow on major social media sites, there's video content to learn and SoundCloud content, like I'm happy anyone that just wants to learn could just type which in and then my uh, hashtag so speak which in to me will most likely come up and um yeah other than that I'm just yeah really just pushing content out in the world for anyone that wants to learn um with YouTube is tricky I think that there's two different YouTubes now like a child-friendly YouTube and a general YouTube and I don't know much about that. And I was also thinking about diving into TikTok because it's so popular right now. But I looked at it and for someone that's almost in their 30s like me, like I don't really understand how to create content on it, but it's so popular right now. And I really like the point where it's like how fast social media sites can come and go, which is yeah, really a reminder for me. If Facebook ever shuts down one day, and um, I can really relate to what Ben says as well. I just wanted to add that in there as well because I'm not fluent in my language and a lot of even when I learned from dictionaries and elders, and particularly my own grandmother, uh, uh, people say it's still wrong. So I'm like, I don't know what I can do. <laughs> Trying my best. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Thanks to everyone for sharing. We're just about at the end of our hour together, so I don't want to take too much of everyone's time. Uh, but let me ask if uh, Robert or Sally Coco, do you have any final uh, words of insight or encouragement you'd like to uh, give to the uh, our three social language um, advocates? Um, well, I would just re reiterate what I said earlier. Just Just jump in, just do it, just keep it going. I think you guys are doing good things and um, it'll pay off in the long run. Preston, would you like to offer any 
Yeah, last advice. Well, I agree with Robert. I think that uh, you deserve a lot of encouragement. Uh, this is being created really in a positive way. And uh, thank you very much for you know, setting up models for other people to follow. Yeah, well, thank you all of you for uh, yeah, what you're doing and taking that risk to put yourselves out there just to share your love for your language, encourage people to use it and learn it. Thanks for taking your time to come and be with us in this webinar. Hope it's been encouraging, helpful for you as well as for those who are listening. Uh, obviously, there was a lot more that we could have talked about. This conversation could go on for hours, but we hope it continues in other venues, wherever you are. Uh, maybe so you'll be able to talk with more friends or share more with other people uh, online about what you're doing. Uh, so thanks for being a part of it. It's been really a pleasure. Glad you're all able to join us and hope you have a great rest of your day or evening, wherever you are. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Merci. Thank you. Thank you.